Um, so welcome everyone, um, for all the viewers who are pouring in from all across the world. Um, this is our, just a second. So this is our eBiz masterclass and uh, today we'll be covering B2B demand generation checklist with a very talented gentleman we have with us, Nemanja Zivkovic. And um, you know, he's an avid basketballer as I get to know and uh, he has had many positions in the ecosystem of marketing from being a business advisor to his own chief marketing officer positions and then he's a CEO of Funky Marketing himself. So it's great to have you. You have a lot of experience and we hope to learn a lot from you. And um, let me just give our viewers what, uh, a sense of what they're expecting today. So today um, we'll be talking about B2B demand generation and uh, the, the goal of eBiz Masterclass that we're hosting from Chloris today is that we want to give you growth hacks and strategies and industry insights and leadership lesson from the experienced and the most talented people in the e-commerce and uh, distribution industry. So that's our goal and uh, over to you, Shiva. So is it a morning or afternoon for you, Neiman? Yeah? It's uh, actually 3 p.m. Okay. So it's in the middle. <laughs> Good timing. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the right time for, for this kind of thing. So I'm not hungry and I'm not very tired. Okay. Okay. So how is everything um, going? Um, your personal life, professional life, we're towards uh, the end of the year, um, entering into the Q4. So tell us about your journey so far in 2020. Yeah, I mean, it, it got interesting in this year because like uh, I, I founded the company in January, I think 13th. And so far, like uh, I was actually planning not to hire anybody in in this year just to see how entrepreneurship feels and and thing because i weren't an entrepreneur before i was like the the cmo director of operation gm i was in all decision making positions and all the um, starting positions before that in different agencies and startups and this is like the first time that i'm actually running the show uh, and it's been so far it's been cool like it's five of us now uh even even more if we count people who are just doing some uh some small things around us just uh, like growing and i think uh the company that, that i'm creating is the one who is actually like actionable when we don't play defense we're always in offense just trying to change things trying to change Marketing, I'd like to say, take it back to where it belongs, where there's some kind of ethics, when we respect each other, when we uh, don't go over that road, like who said it, Seth Godin, who is like all the marketing are liars. Mm -hmm. So trying to get, get away from that and involve customers and clients as much as possible into the conversation. And yeah, I mean, doing some things that, uh, that I've been wanting to do for years. But for some reason, like even it's the environment or is the, the CEO or the owners that I didn't have a chance to do it. So now like I'm unleashed and just going to get it. And on the private life, uh, it's about time that I'm getting married, like 36 years old. So uh, great time. And I think uh, we're going into the great uh, ending of the year. Good. So uh, tell us about your company, Funky Marketing. So how did you end up uh, coming up with this name? Yeah, I mean, um, funky, keep it funky was the, the sentence that is on my phone for the last, I don't know, 10 or even more years. It's just something that um, I grew up playing basketball. So we had this uh, listening to hip hop, then comes the gangstar and uh, Motown period and all kind of uh, different um, influences connecting to, to the funk music. And uh, basically it all created uh, uh, not an environment, but uh, a frame in, in my head that uh, funky marketing is marketing being done the right way. So uh, like even I think 11 years ago, I created a funky marketing group on Facebook. It wasn't called like funky marketing. It was called a little later like that, but um, 
mean, I've been developing the, the community on the side and just growing it. And that's how, how it goes. I checked out if the domain is free, it's free, it's a great name. It's every, I, when I get into conversation with anybody, they just say like funky music, they compare it to the funky business, also the book. And I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good name for branding. Cool. So uh, uh, this session is all about demand gen, but we'll touch upon a couple of other interesting topics as well on, uh, I mean, in the marketing as well. So to, uh, to understand more about marketing or for someone who's new to, you know, the marketing um, industry. So how has the marketing been evolved over the past 10 years? I mean, you know, things like copywriting or you know, design were not a center stage of attention in 2010, right? So, but things have completely changed now in 2020. So how do you, how do you actually see that? Um, I'm seeing it that uh, people didn't want to go the right way willingly or their own will, so Corona made them uh, in a way like, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, it was uh, all marketing was done in communication with an agency and a company. So uh, basically nobody asked customers what do they want. They didn't have a, a voice because it was all print media, television, radio, when there's no communication with, uh, with the clients or the customers. And um, basically, we were uh, able to, to see and hear anything they serve us. So that was the marketing, one way communication. And now things, things change and with, with internet, the customers got uh, all the power, all the strengths, and now they are the ones who are orchestrating the way, the way we do, the way we work, the way we, uh, the way we create our products, everything. And uh, basically just, doing the thing and focusing on the, on the wrong measurements was something that was more common, not getting emotions involved, especially in B2B, like nobody is involving still emotions or those things that are um, known to B2C. Uh, nobody's been using that in, in B2B. It was like a company, like a shell. Nobody has been saying that hey, there's actually people inside the company running it, working in it, uh, like just living half of their day in, in those institutions, in, in those companies. And finally, when Corona struck, some, some of the company realized that they can change some things, but um, I was predicting that things will change even more when it comes to like focusing on uh, on MQLs, on meaningless leads, those kind of things, just focusing on the right metrics and strategies, but unfortunately it still didn't change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, what is uh, demand gen actually? I mean, what is demand generation and how does it uh, you know, differ from the typical lead generation activity that we're doing currently? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, question and some of the, and a question that a lot of people uh, don't realize uh, the difference uh, between those two, especially, I don't know how it is over there, but in my environment in Serbia, like people don't even know that demand generation exists. It's all about lead generation, it's all about leads, uh, and, and that's it. So uh, let's try to, to define the two of them. First one, lead generation is like, usually a short-term strategy that is focused to deliver uh, contacts to sales so, so they can sell them products or services. The number of leads is usually high, but the quality is very low. Uh, often with, um, with the quality who is like uh, even is the same as outbound, even uh, maybe lower quality. Uh, an example would be, is a common example, like ebook download over the Facebook ads or LinkedIn ads go with a follow-up from the sales. So basically you download the, the ebook and they, they start calling you, come and buy from us. Uh, demand generation on the other hand is, is a bit different. It's a um, strategy that's focused on the buyer with a goal to create awareness and educate them, educate the market. Or, uh, so uh, as many people as possible would uh, be educated and come to the sales team 
to buy. So basically we are creating demand around our products or services. Uh, number of leads is uh, low. Uh, it's not even close to the, to the leads that we can get during the lead generation, but leads are uh, the best quality possible with the highest percent of those who are converting and the shorter uh, sales cycle. It's, it's shorter than the call outbound, it's shorter than any other things that we are doing it because we are educating people and they are coming to us when they are ready. Uh, an example would be like, uh, I don't know, uh, promoting of the case study of the buyer that had great success with, with your product uh, without any CTA or maybe live Q&A like this one with somebody who is like professional for your niche and all with a great, uh, without intent to, to sell. So zero intent to sell. We are just educating and when people who are listening to this, maybe when they are ready to, to get your services or they maybe reach out to me, uh, they, will, they will reach out. Not until they are ready for, for, uh, for buy. Mm -hmm. So two things were actually better uh, compared to Legion then. So one is uh, the opportunities and uh, one is the person. So we get uh, more better opportunities with the demand gen because we're focused more on the customers. And uh, similarly, let's say it's not about producing 100 leads, right? It's just about producing 20 quality leads. And then you get at least like 15 or 16 conversion from there because that's what uh, the demand gen is all about, right? So. Uh, how do you handle uh, the inbound and, and then the ABM, like, I mean, the account-based marketing? Is that part of the demand gen or is that a completely different marketing strategy, I mean, altogether? Yeah, um, that's an interesting, an interesting topic. Uh, for what you said, yes, uh, inbound is, uh, is, is great because people are coming to us. And when it comes to account-based marketing, I don't really count it as, uh, as a demand generation strategy. Yes, it is in a way, but I see it more as just targeting. And I don't think we can talk about account-based marketing if we have less than, I don't know, um, like seven or 800 uh, accounts that we are targeting. So this is, when we look at it from that perspective, it's only on the level of the enterprise not uh, on the lower level. So uh, basically it's who we are targeting. If we cannot go with account-based marketing if, uh, and dedicate time to each um, account when, if we have like the smaller company. We don't have people to do that. We don't have resources. But on the other hand, uh, when we are doing like demand gen, it doesn't have to be account-based marketing. We are still having a persona. We are still identifying who are we targeting. So we know the demography, the, the age, the interests, all kinds of things, their position in the company, seniority and everything else. And we know exactly who we are targeting, let's say on LinkedIn. They are all over there. We can see those people inside the company. So it's not some foggy, uh, person that we are targeting, like some CEO or some CEO, it's the exact person we know who we are targeting. And uh, based on that, we can, we can adapt the strategy and everything and everything else. And um, it's different what you said uh, from the outbound. In outbound, basically, we are going general, we are going wide. Uh, if we want to target as many, as many people and accounts as possible through the outbound, then we need to go general. We cannot get uh, personal and it affects the results in a way. And if we are doing inbound, then it's a bit, a bit different. We go more personal. We, that's why we use content. We use content so we can educate people. They can come to us. If we are going to them, then it's account-based marketing, but account-based marketing connected to the content, then basically it opens the door for us, right? If the content marketing is being done right, then account-based marketing is being done uh, more easily in that way. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if there is one 
thing that's been there forever between the sales team and the marketing team that's going to be MQL and then you know SQL. So traditionally, when teams focus more on lead numbers, uh, you know what marketing team considered uh, lead might not convert into an opportunity. I mean the SQL part. So uh, to clarify, you know how is this applicable in Demandgen? I mean, like what is an MQL and uh, what is SQL technically? It's it's easy to, to qualify it, I mean, to, uh, and to define it, the name itself tells us marketing qualified leads is somebody who, uh, who has been interested in get, finding more information about, about the topic. So they are watching the webinar, they are reading the ebook, they are reading the article, whatever is here, let's say the, the lead magnet. And on the other hand, SQLs are those who are sales qualified leads, so qualified to talk with the sales. So uh, the, the mistake that's been um, done very often is that uh, all MQLs that are coming uh, are being directly sent to the sales. So they are not being qualified for the sales. They didn't click the button and say, I want to talk with sales, I want to buy, I want to try a demo. No, they just say, okay, I want to read that goddamn book. And, and that's it. And if you are trying to just to sell them, they will know. I mean, just if they download the, the let's say, ebook, and uh, I like to compare it with, uh, with the first date. So you actually meet someone on Tinder, and you end up uh, on, a, on a blind date, you've been drinking and you end up in bed with somebody. Tomorrow morning, you wake up, uh, your head is clean and you see who is in the bed next to you, you know? And uh, compared to the, to the lead generation in MQLs, basically it, uh, it means uh, you go to the, to the landing page, you download the book and when you open the email to see what you got over there, yeah, you see it's like the 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 day after, you know. And uh, it's it's kind of kind of interesting because you get uh, the intimacy over there in the email. It's one on one communication, like you are together in the bed. And if uh, you are just creating, I don't know, one page uh, PDF with like five things you should do to. Uh, to get more people to your webinar and it's just like five sentences nothing else then they will get disappointed because it's not the document that you promised them and it relationship won't happen so ebook uh, doesn't gonna works out right so it's it's just a way where uh, marketing team is gonna come up with that numbers i mean mqls is that correct yeah um Let's see, it's not every, the, the e-books doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The shitty e-books don't work. Like when, when, we started, when we started Funky Marketing, like we created uh, an e-book, which is actually a strategy with our examples, results and everything. And if somebody downloaded it, uh, they would get like five more uh, emails follow up just to give them more info, like more examples more everything, but not to get them like you must uh, get our services. So no, basically they have to decide. And if they decide not to go with us, they have this document, which by itself is a value. So, and it was like 30 pages strategy document, not just like simple one page uh, ebook. So you gotta get value in each step of the way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the moment they 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 just downloaded your ebook, and then the sales team is going to send an email. Hey, I saw uh, you just downloaded the ebook. Do you want a demo from for for the product? And that's where uh, the sales literally, you know, dies. You're you're not selling anything, and you're not literally giving away the benefit as well, right? So yeah, coming it's, back to it's uh, basically you know that situation when you are walking the street and somebody trying to to sell you the postcards. <laughs> you want to buy? You want to buy? You want to buy? I can no get away from here. Yeah, I mean, just give, give, give whatever, uh, you know, the customers or the prospects are looking for, just give them. And then if they find it interesting, if they find uh, the benefit interesting, they'll just come back and then ask you, hey, uh, what else do you got, right? So uh, coming back to the demo request, so how to, you know, 
generate qualified uh, demo requests. I mean, like, let's say uh, a proper lead that generates more opportunities. Yeah, I mean, you need to educate, you need to educate uh, people before they come to the website and before they come to the, to uh, that request a demo. Uh, you need to go over the pain points and talk in details, uh, what are the features of your products? What are the specifics? How are you different from the others? Let's, let's go just a look at the white picture. First, there are people that have no idea that they even have a problem. Not even that they know that you have the solution and that solution exists. So they don't know that there is a problem. And um, I like to use the example of like, it's not connected to the B2B, but it's a good example. Like I want to, uh, to arrange my balcony so I can enjoy spending time over there. And uh, somebody is trying to sell me um, a vase for the flowers. So uh, basically, uh, I have no idea that I need it. But when I start thinking that, okay, uh, it's my balcony, what do I need to feel comfortable over there? So first I need some chairs, then I need a table, then I need maybe some pictures on the walls. And then I come to the flowers. At the end, so uh, those people who are trying to sell me that, they need to draw me a picture another perspective so I can imagine it. And this is how it goes. First, we need to see that there is a problem. Then we need to explain to those people that there is a solution to that problem. And when they know the solution, then they are looking to find uh, a company that's gonna give them the solution. So uh, then we go into details. You know, like we have these, uh, I don't know, uh, specific kind of flowers, but those other guys, they don't have it or we deliver uh, today and when you, if you go with them, you need to like wait three days to get that. Like those kind of specific things. And uh, when you have all that, when you inform those people and they come to the website, they will, they will use the demo because demo is the better option. Uh, actually, no, uh, demo is the, word, the, the option that is not uh, the best the best is free trials. Demo is usually a, a sales call on which in most cases, sales per people are talking about the product, about everything and not talking about how to help them. And this is uh, a common mistake that's happening. Uh, something I didn't talk about, but it is a problem, the common one. On the other hand, if we have like uh, a free trials, then, uh, customer can get results even in an hour when they start using the free trial, right? They get the value right away. And those kind of things are, uh, are some things that are small adjustment, but maybe changing, changing the game. And uh, we need to create trust. So they, when they come to the website, then convert on the website, if there's, op if it, the website is optimized for conversions, they will happen but they will happen if we get the right people with the right mindset over there. So we need uh, videos so we can, uh, they can actually see who are the people behind the brand. Like, how do I talk? How do I look? What's the personality? Am I the funny guy or no? They need to see all the features on the product. So uh, how do they solve their problems? What are the specifics? And they need to also see the, the wider picture that we talked about the first, the first step, and it is to realize that there's actually a problem out there. When we get them through the end step and they come to the website, then they will be able to, to convert. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the product should actually needs to talk for itself in, instead of moving them to, you know, like uh, the demo request, right? Uh, I mean, that's, that's right uh, when we're talking about the website. <laughs> Not, not before that. If we just say, okay, we, go, we don't want to do marketing, the product is good enough, that's not going to happen. That's like, build it and they will come. No, they won't. You need to show them all those specific things. You need to get them inside your story. This is, this is something that, uh, that uh, is familiar to B2C. Mm -hmm. When like, we need to get them emotionally involved with the brand, with the company, with the product. And like, 
we are not the Batman in the story. We are like the Robin. We marketeers are the ones who are taking the customers, which is, customer is Batman. We are helping them get to the goal and defeat the bad guy. The bad guys are the, the pain points and the problems they're having. So uh, we need to get them emotionally inside, inside the story to show them like how the product is being made, uh, how are other people satisfied with it, so the testimonials, uh, do they have results when they use the products, like what happens after they use the product, all those things are important and they create the full, the full picture. So you talked about the process, right? So uh, uh, when during the initial stages, when we talk about the benefits and then when we talk about the categories and other things, so is that more like we just have to pull in into the category first? I mean, even before we convince them or talk about the company, the brand, uh, just tell them about the category first, just tell them what this is all about and then tell about your company. Is that how it works? I wouldn't say it's, it's the category. Uh, I would say it's first the customers. In, let, let me give you like the perfect scenario when you build the company uh, or, the, or the product. So the, the first thing would be creating a community around the people that you're trying to sell something. So let's say who did the good job there. Uh, Drift did an excellent job. They, they gathered the community of uh, product people and they asked them, what do you do? They had no idea how to tell it uh, and people around them, they had even, even less uh, knowledge about what the product people do. So the product people were pissed about it. And when somebody's pissed about something, it means that they are perfect target group. So they gather them around the community and they let them talk to each other. They just followed, they listen, and then they come up with conversational marketing around that and then they come up with the next product and the next product and they keep delivering on that but they started with a community so you first need people who have that problem and then you just can come up with even the multiple products not only with one or the services however do we do we call it that's the perfect scenario when it comes to that yeah that's a great example uh yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. So you just have to figure out what your audiences are looking for, what the customers are looking for. And from there, you just have to drive in into the category and then other things. Yeah, and I mean, uh, Drift created the new category and I don't think many people can do that. I mean, many people don't know how to do it. I don't know if I could do it, uh, but so this is not for, for everybody. Uh, but I mean, they also did some of the things that, uh, that are not scalable. They even wrote a book, this one scale. <laughs> and like, I, I remember I was working as director of operations in another agency and we bought the conversational marketing book by Drift. And I think two weeks after that, we received uh, another book from Drift and it's, it, it's one scale, a little book, 40 pages when they wrote, I think 40 things that helped them to scale. And those are things that are not measurable. And we didn't order that book. They just send it to us as, as additional value. And this, this is how you build the brand and this is how you actually build the company and add additional value to anyone. I mean, from US to Serbia, they just shifting it up. Yeah, right, exactly. The next time you're looking for a chat bot, I think you'll go to Drift, right? That's what they built so far. Yeah, I mean, I had it on my website since we started Funky Marketing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and if you really look at it, uh, the marketing team just won the pipeline, right? But things have changed completely. I've been, you know, listening to a few CMOs where they, they've been, you know, kept on telling one thing, uh, that the marketing team should won the revenue. So to go one step further, uh, you know, the, if, if the sales and accounts team is bringing in 50% of the revenue, then the marketing team should actually bring in the rest of the 50% through the new logos, right? So I actually saw one of your recent posts as well, where you said marketing is not just about the revenue, it's, it's something more than that. So what are your, you know, thoughts over there? Yeah, um, my, my opinion is that, uh, and I'm talking about this a lot, that marketing shouldn't have a separate goal a go uh, on its own marketing is here to help business achieve its goals and to be able to do that it need to respond directly 
to the CEO. So not to the to the sales, not to the to the revenue. It should respond directly to the CEO because um, marketing is actually the closest thing to the revenue, and uh, it can be great only if like the management understands marketing. There are so many good marketeers that left the companies because the CEO or decision makers didn't understand the marketing. Um, and because marketing is more than sales, like people say that marketing is here to uh, enable sales to do the better job. Okay, but that's the side effect. Marketing is here to uh, allow business to achieve its goals. It's the revenue, it's the awareness, it's the brand, it's the advertising. It's a, a product, it's so many, so many things. Like, and that's why I have a problem with also um, defining demand gen. Because if we said like, okay, we are hiring the agency that do is demand generation, or we have the department that is doing demand generation, uh, basically we are saying that they are the only one creating the demand. I mean, if that's the case, that's not good. The whole company should should actually create create the demand and. I mean, marketers, us as marketers, need to go out of our shells and just um, call out all the status quo and the bullshit decisions of uh, people who are decision makers, people who are CEOs, owners, just because we need to get, help them get to the point when they understand how things are going. Most of them um, think about marketing as like, the old school way that worked 15 years ago when they have like HubSpot, uh, only SEO, you do the SEO and you wait for some time and they will come right for the search engines, not for the people. Marketing is only advertising. Um, I don't know, like it, we know that it's important to be on social media, but we are not getting any results out of it. So we won't invest further in it or like, um, we have clients now, so we don't need marketing, but when uh, we run out of the clients, we'll, we'll do marketing. Like it's something that you just press the button and it, and it works. Or if they are measuring too many things and asking you to measure so many things, it means that they, do, they don't believe, they don't believe in, in marketing. And um, I don't know, like there are so many situations uh, where like the sales cycle is too long, let's say eight to nine months, and then uh, the owners or the decision makers in the company, they don't have, they don't know how to measure the marketing efforts. So they are telling them, get us the leads, as many leads as possible. If you are getting us more leads, it means that you are doing the better job. And when it happens, like the guys who are working in sales, they are like, marketing team is not doing anything uh, right again. So uh, they are pissed at marketing uh, because they need to jump on so many sales calls with people who are not actually interested to buy the things that we talked about before. And they need more people than in sales. And when you have more people in sales, then you have people who are not that experienced in sales or with the company. So not every customer experience is the best one because you have new people who are still learning the things. And so when that happens, you're just going deeper and deeper into, uh, I don't know if we can swear on the, on the podcast, but you get what I mean. Uh, and how can we solve that? Basically we can create marketing, can uh, create the content machine, which will educate people and get them to the right stage when they are ready to buy and when they press the button, then they go to the sales. Then we add them to the, to the sales force or whatever we are using. And when this happens, when we get uh, people who are actually qualified for the sales call, then we don't need to have like 10 people in sales. We can go with just two who are experienced and who can close all of them. When they do that, like, we earn more and it goes to the revenue and it can come back to, I don't know, to invest more in marketing or to the salespeople and salespeople can actually do something else, maybe do the outbound. And uh, so this is, this is the case, how, how it should work. And uh, to be able to do that, we don't need marketing and sales just to work together. We need to 
for the management of the company, for the owners, CEO to understand actually what are the benefits of investing in certain parts of the company. Because uh, as it is right now, sales have all the budgets, marketing has a little low budget on the side. Um, also, uh, if a lot of companies are trying to grow from the start just by investing in the sales team, instead of investing in marketing team and then sales is there to support the growth. This is how, how the situation should be, but it's not. And those are all, I consider all those basic things. Like if you look at it from the common sense perspective, this is what you would do, right? But still we are not doing it. And, and I, don't, I don't get it. I had a problem with this for, for a long time to actually, um, to uh, actually start talking about it because I consider it something that's basic, like common thing, everybody knows it. But it seems like majority of the companies have no clue about it. Just think about something else because they're giving marketing some other metrics and they are going after it and it doesn't do good for anybody. <laughs> so uh, you talked about the customers, right? So word of mouth is uh, one of the interesting marketing uh, channel. And uh, so even though, you know, primarily this is because of the product team, uh, but still I, I strongly believe that uh, there is a huge amount of marketing emo effort on the word of mouth. So how to actually streamline uh, the marketing efforts over there? So what else we can actually do uh, to have a, to build a better word of mouth uh, pipeline actually? What do you think? What is the answer? <laughs> To more, uh, to do more podcasts or video stuff like this to get the testimonials. Is that is that what it is? Yeah, I mean it's, uh, some of it. Yeah, uh, I mean it's a, it's a great question. Not that many people are asking it, so I, pre I appreciate it. And I think word of mouth is uh, extremely important. And I was just reading today a post on LinkedIn when they say, marketers, what will you do when you cannot? look at the analytics when Google doesn't give you the insights, when the Google changes and becomes like question and answer platform, what, how will you measure world of mouth? So and it, it's a good question, something that we need to talk about. I mean, uh, creating uh, an environment to get the world of mouth to spread around is something that I think it's in the core of the main gen and uh, we can do it in, in many different ways. Uh, how do we do it here in Funky Marketing? I can say that. Uh, basically, when we start working with a, with a company, we actually first try to get the demand that's over there. So basically by, uh, by activating all the decision makers in the company and just going over there where the demand is. So uh, if it's, let's say LinkedIn, we go, to the people who are influencers, who are gathering the people uh, around their posts who are either our target group or are the people who are um, the same as, as us going towards them. So in those two ways, and in that way, we get also the people who are our target group to talk about us and we get also the people who are same as us to recommend us to somebody else. So when it comes to the actual content, it can be a lot of different ways. Uh, one of uh, one thing that's uh, the must have is personal stories, adding that to the pain points and telling it from your personal perspective, sharing the story, sharing your journey. The other one is uh, giving value to some form of the video content, especially today. It, I think it's the most important thing. This is the first thing that we recommend to the clients that we start working with. Uh, why? Because you can actually say, okay, I'm going to do the interview series. It doesn't have to be the podcast. And I can get 10 people who are inside my target group to be my guest on the podcast. So I get to do one on one with them. I get to ask them all the specific questions so we can go all the way to the buyer's journey. We can then uh, publish that video, send it to them so they can share it also uh, when they share it their team will see it we will add them just so so they can they can see it also on our profiles and uh, basically that is the first step we get into one-on-one -on -one conversations with them then we can continue continue from that and if we keep 
creating podcasts just to get value to the people, not to follow up with some sales proposition or to offer them something or whatever, but be there each week. Like I'm doing this with Marty Sanchez B2B Weekly. Uh, also like Chris Walker is doing it with Demand Gen uh, Live. Uh, so weekly we are there for the people to answer their questions to share results, to share methods, strategies, all the things that we are discovering with, with no hesitation. And it's a hard thing to do, to find topics, to be there every week and to go over there and people appreciate it. Uh, also, another thing is um, to involve other people inside, uh, inside what you do. So let's say we're creating videos, okay, but when we are distributing it, we are uh, mentioning those people, we are mentioning the company, everything else, and it creates buzz, not only around that episode, but around our page, our profile, and it gathers the world of mouth. And it's important. Also, uh, one small thing that can make a huge difference is, are, the, let's say, the comments on LinkedIn. So if you just go and comment, it counts as a, as a post on LinkedIn. Like, like, comment, post are the same thing because they can, see, they can be seen on the profile. And if you just go and get into that, give value in each post, like great post, not that kind of, but just get into details, share some analytics, some results, info. It's totally different. Also, if you create ads, in, in a way that, uh, that people can uh, gather around the specific ad and get into organic conversation. You will get even more better results when it comes to uh, performance of those ads. And you will also get the exposure, which is organic. So your reach is gonna be better. You will uh, get better results, but at the same time, people will remember you because they got into discussion on your own post. So they, it doesn't matter if they get the answer for somebody else, but it's like we are playing, playing in your yard. And uh, those are small things that are important. And when it comes to uh, measurements, I think this is important to say when we're talking about the world of mouth. Uh, LinkedIn is uh, a platform where B2B is, uh, is living and it's hard to measure over there. Yeah. Uh, because LinkedIn doesn't give us uh, too many insights. So how do we measure world mouth? I like to do it in a couple of ways. First one is uh, I'm watching who's, uh, who's commenting on my post. I'm watching if those people are uh, tagging decision makers from their companies in my posts. Also, is somebody sharing the post? Who is sharing the post? And also you get a lot of uh, messages uh, in your inbox because there are some decision makers who don't want to get publicly involved in conversations, but want to give you your opinion or contact you directly. So uh, these are all the things that, are, um, that you can measure. Also one thing, and I don't think that many people realize how important it is, is that uh, some people are invincible to us. So uh, especially on LinkedIn, like somebody can watch my video, Usually it's, it's the video because we cannot measure who you, we cannot see who is watching the video and they just come to the website and schedule a call. That's it. We're not, we're not connected. They're not following the page, anything, but they must have come to some from somewhere. So I'm asking them and they say, okay, we saw the video because one of the people they are connected with, uh, liked it. So it popped up in their feed. They watched it. Aha. Uh -huh. This guy knows something, they ask that, that person, they say, okay, oh, we are following, like, let's say, Nemanja, for a long time, you should go to him and talk to him, so they schedule a call. It's that simple sometimes. Yeah, it's more about um, getting into, you know, whatever your audiences are, your customers are, and build a conversation around there. So it's not just about one marketing channel. If, if they are on Instagram, just go there, build a conversation around there, and uh, like you said, I think uh, the decade old, year old, uh, the testimonials are just a simple case that you won't work. Like you said, I think uh, uh, just two minute, three minute testimonial may not work. But let's say if we bring them on our podcast and then if we uh, get onto a conversation and then if they get to share that within their own community or, or people in their space, 
then that's again more like the word of mouth, like you said. Uh, that, that's a great strategy to, to bring the customers on the podcast and ask them straight away what do they think about the product, about the services. That, that, that's great, a great one. Um, also, the, when it comes to testimonials, what works the best in my experience is when we get to sit offline with, with a customer and uh, like doing so uh, in a form of an interview, the camera is recording, let's say behind my head and I'm talking with a, with a customer and they're telling from their perspective. So how did they find us? How did they actually define the problem? So how did they find us? Why did they choose us? How the, convers- the whole partnership started? Um, what happened? Did we uh, did good? How were the results? And what are they going to do next? Are they continuing working with us or we gave them enough knowledge and results or whatever it is to go further? So, but from their perspective, they need to, to tell it. So it's more powerful. It can be said in three minutes. It can be said in up to 10 minutes. It all depends what kind of format are you using. But uh, I think this is the, the strongest one, stronger than, than any written testimonials or, or whatever it is. Also, um, when you do it like that and you get the um, customers to actually comment on that and to confirm it, or even sharing just a screenshot of the written testimonial with the customer who is actually commenting and confirming it, that's, that's a jackpot. Like last night, I, I shared the feedback that we got from the women that scheduled a call with us for like Friday. So a sales call and she read the newsletter and she gave us the feedback. Like it's, it's one of the best newsletter that we ever read. It's the, maybe the best ever. So I shared that screenshot. Uh, I weren't connected with her. So, uh, okay, I said, I'm gonna go and share it. So I tagged her, she responded, yes, of course you should, uh, you should tag me. This is something that I enjoyed, I confirm it. And just out of one post, we got like around 80 visits on the website, three scheduled calls, 29 new subscribers. And I think I got on my profile, like around 80 new followers. So this is, the power of the content that is relevant and that is confirmed by the, by the, by the client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was about to ask you about that uh, conversation. So uh, you recently started uh, the email newsletter back, right? So um, I actually wanted to understand, like, I mean, what was the content? So I actually subscribed to your newsletter just to, you know, look at the content, how you're writing and uh, things like that. So what uh, most of the companies are doing wrong right now when it comes to the newsletter. So where do you want them to correct it or, uh, how do you want them to kind of like write it down? Basically, um, it all depends. Like I specialize in email marketing, so I can go into performance. I can go into all kinds of stuff. But uh, right now, what I see is uh, we just try to, uh, to get them the value. Nothing else. Do not ask for anything. They always have this link to to click on the contact us and maybe schedule a call with us. But we try to distribute the best LinkedIn post of the funky marketing team through the email. So we're curating them. I even name like Martin from uh, from funky marketing. He's our demand gen manager. So basically, I name him Master Martin, and this is the name that he is using for the newsletter. So we personalized the, the funky marketing newsletter. It's his now, and uh, he's using uh, the best uh, post that we are uh, putting out there on LinkedIn to uh, curate it and send it out to the, to the people. So they don't need to like go around and look for content. And when you look at like that, we post a lot. Like the whole team is posting one to two times uh, a day. I'm posting up to three times a day. So it's a lot of content in a week. And then we try to curate the best one and to get them uh, just for them to consume it. Then also we are recording like two podcasts. So we, we are not sharing them over the newsletter. This is something that will change. But um, so we were pretty inactive. Uh, I think I wrote that in a post when it comes to newsletter. 
because it was only me for the first couple of months and I've been sharing like my stories and experience and everything else. So at one point I just stopped uh, because I didn't want to use the newsletter just to inform people. Okay, we have the new podcast. Okay, we have the new webinar. Okay, we have something, the new article. So I wanted to give them the real value. If I'm writing it, it's just the value over there. So now when it's like a couple of us in the company, we can uh, bring it back and give like the straight value. And I'm happy that the feedback was there because those are the, the posts that we are already seeing people react to it. And then there are around 600 people that we have on the newsletter. So uh, those are people who are subscribed to hear from us and to, and we try to get them only only the best of uh, of what we are talking about and it's interesting because we didn't give them any value like if you subscribe to our blog like two months ago like last week was the first time that you would hear from us so you probably forgot that you subscribed to the funky marketing blog and i said okay i'm seeing the number of subscribers going up so uh let's give people what they want they want to hear from us we're going to give it to them that's that's as simple as possible mm -hmm. so i'll just come back to the uh, demand gen that's now uh, if i wanted to begin you know setting up a demand gen team uh, where should i start it's a, it's a good question i always say that you should start with uh, with distribution because uh, there are many companies that have great content great content which is bringing them um, SEO traffic, traffic from Google and those are articles written for the uh, for the search engines but are good article that needs just a little more structure and a little tone of voice that can be distributed and they can be great content when you uh, distribute it on LinkedIn, on Quora, on Zest, on Twitter or somewhere else. So. Basically, you need a person who can plan out the distribution strategy and who can actually uh, get that content in front of the right people. I think this is the most important thing. You can always outsource the, somebody to write articles, but you need a person who knows what kind of articles do you need, what do you want to get out of them, and for whom you are writing them. So if, when you know those kind of things, then you can outsource somebody to actually write the articles. I mean, I'm always um, suggesting that the companies should have their own content marketing department. But uh, basically, if you have somebody who knows how it's done and you don't want to hire just writers around you, then you can, you can outsource it. And uh, distribution, um, if you ask me, is the most important part of the demand gen. And it's the part that uh, has been on the side for too many uh, years. Uh, and I think even now, not that many companies are figuring out the distribution. So basically the distribution isn't, if you just share your blog post on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on the company pages that nobody sees. And uh, actually it's gonna be seen because like those 14 people from your company will see it. Maybe let's say up to 40, it can be happen, but those are not the people that you are targeting. Those are actually uh, the people from the company because they will also like it and their family will see it and you don't want to target their family, you want somebody else. And uh, then it's done. When you do that, you don't distribute the content anywhere else. You forget about it on the website and you create more and more and more and just stays over there on the website, uh, like spiders around it <laughs> and nothing happens until somebody can come who can distribute the content the right way to the right people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's just, just not about writing blogs or having the landing pages and then uh, hire a SEO guy and then sit there for a while. That's not how it's gonna work out, right? I think SEO also needs to change because SEO should be somebody that is uh, bringing the right people to consume the content, not just the people who are writing the content and 
waiting for the search engines to work. I think death time is, uh, is best and SEO also needs to change. You cannot prom come to me as, I mean, let's say I'm the company owner and you come to me and you try to offer me SEO services and you say, well, maybe we'll have results in six months. Like mm -hmm. I've been doing SEO. You, you can tell me more specific things than that. I know. And if you don't want to tell me, I know that you either don't want to or you're not good at what you do. So six months are enough to get, to get specific results. But uh, I mean, look, how do I see the content creation and distribution? Um, a lot of companies that I say that have great content, they have been in the SEO train. So they have keywords figured out they have the persona figure out based on that they create the content and they leave it on the website. So when a person comes who can do the distribution, you have it all over there. Still uh, a lot of people are trying to do it again. So coming up with a, with a new copy, uh, writing new things, doing the research, I mean, the research and everything has been done already before. You just need to get to that content a ton of voice to just distribute it into the into the batches and maybe give it a new life with some visuals and go ahead and distribute it. That's all that you need to know. Is that simple? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So before we uh, wrap this up, uh, one last quick question. So you also launched a podcast recently, right? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So why do you launch? Uh, why do you want to launch a podcast? And uh, so how that's gonna help your company grow? And uh, how? What kind of? Uh, um, I mean, how do you actually measure the podcast? So that's one thing I wanted to address it to the B2B marketers. And then, so uh, uh, what's the goal for the podcast for the next six months or 12 months? Yeah, uh, this is the second podcast that, that we have. First one is uh, B2B Weekly that I'm doing with Marty Sanchez. And we are doing that podcast just for two reasons. One is to give value to the people because we're doing it live with the people uh, on Zoom. And the other one is to get content for our profiles. That's it. That's the goal, to get the content. Uh, funky marketing, on the other hand, is the, the podcast when, for now, only me, but it's going to be another host, when we are interviewing uh, marketers, designers, uh, business developers, entrepreneurs, so be good people who are working, doing good things for the good people. And I'm trying to get their personal stories, their view on some of the things that are specific for the industry uh, going on right now. How do we measure it? Well, uh, also by creating, creating content and giving value inside, inside it. So basically we're gonna use the content when other people are talking, our guests, and build a brand out of our company. I don't hide it. I, I tell it to each one of them. We're going to use all of you. We are bringing you here to talk for an hour, to have a chat, to get your insights, knowledge, results, everything else. And we are publishing that content on our page. So uh, bringing, uh, bringing, building their brand uh, on our page. And by doing that, we are building the funky marketing brand. And uh, Basically, that's it. Out of one piece of content, we can get from 10 to 20 smaller pieces of video or audiograms or something else. We get the headline, we get the transcriptions, and we just uh, distribute it over there. They will talk about it. They will share it with their friends. Uh, we will get more people to listen to the podcast. So the awareness is being built. Also, we are publishing it on um, YouTube. So YouTube is great for branding. So we are also uh, building the funky marketing brand. And uh, one thing that we can do is we can follow the number of people who are uh, listening to each episode. And even if it's like 10 people, we're okay because it's 10 specific people. If they are coming back each week, it means that it means something to them. It means that uh, we are giving them the value and it means that the world of mouth will start working and they will start recommending us to somebody else, the podcast or us as somebody who is providing the services. Awesome. Awesome. 
So a couple of quick questions uh, before we uh, wrap this up. And uh, so who's your favorite CMO? CMO? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Uh, it was David, Dave Gerhardt when he was uh, CMO of, of Drift. Mm. Now, I don't know, I'm not very, like, I'm not the favor of CMO position. I think it can be something that's a little bit different and I think we're gonna change that in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. So if you have to pick uh, one company that is very good at demand gen, uh, what would it be other than your company? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, Refine Labs, but just based on the, on the Chris Walker, who is an active uh, CEO, and maybe Megan over there. So Gravy, Gravy is, is a great example because they are, um, demand is coming out of the conversation that are happening inside the company. So let's say LinkedIn is just a, a rooftop on, on everything that's happening inside. And this is how they get the demand. They get into a simple conversation, those kind of things. Also Gong, Gong because they are going uh, in a different direction than anybody else. Like they made a party, a Zoom party, and they uh, talked about it on their uh, LinkedIn page, company yeah. page. Yeah, so exactly. with DJs, with everything else, it's just something that's totally different than anybody else and that not that many companies can reproduce. So, I mean, they have a lot of other things that are good, but just talking about uh, about few companies. Yeah, one interesting thing I heard from Chris about Refrain Labs is they don't even do the cold calling and then he hated it. So that was one interesting thing. Uh, I mean, for, for, for the companies that are doing more of a sales activity, more of a cold calling, uh, because they are definitely into more of uh, the demand gen, so that's one metric. And uh, so one last quick question. So one B2B brand uh, that does stellar marketing? Hmm. All, all of them that I mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, definitely, uh, I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of B2B companies that uh, can be used as bad examples. And yeah, but definitely I think Gang does a very good job. So uh, I was listening to one of his uh, podcasts, I think 18 months ago, they had like 4,000 followers on the LinkedIn and then they are at 50,000 followers right now after 18 months. So yeah, yeah. You, you know, what's, what's the one thing that stands out for me is all those companies didn't exist a few years ago. Yeah. So uh, they are hiring new people that have the awareness that uh, of the importance of the personal brand, of the company's brand, of being out there, being interactive, sharing their knowledge, results, their journey. Companies that have been um, here for more years, older companies, they don't have that luxury because people in the company are older. Not maybe in years, but in understanding. And the way they do the sales, the marketing, they don't understand why would they go out and share something when they didn't share it for like 20 years? And this is the advantage that they have over everybody else. Awesome. Perfect, uh, Nehemiah. I took some extra time. And uh, thank you so much for uh, spending your afternoon with us. And it was nice talking to you. And I had a great fan. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure.